We are presently in a multi-week preaching series about key questions in Scripture. And we have dealt with several types of questions. We dealt with the very first questions that existed in the Bible and went on to deal with other types of questions. Right now we're dealing with intellectual questions. And these are questions that we look at in the Word of God that broaden, that go into the mind, that touch the intellect, that cause us to think. And so we've asked several questions in this category. One is, where were you when I made the world? And that's when God confronted Job and uh, put him in a place where he understood that, that, that <laughs> there's God and then there's Job and they're not the same person. <laughs> that Job needs to listen rather than speak. And so it was an intellectual question about the beginnings of creation. And then we asked the intellectual question, he that planted the ear, doth he not hear? And we went into that whole idea about God being a person and that when he made us, he made us in his image. And then when God dealt with Jonah, he said, dost thou do well to be angry? Uh, that is, our, our intellect should be in charge of our emotions. Well, I'm going to deal with what is kind of an intellectual question if you broaden it, but I don't want to do any damage to the context. We're going to deal with the context of this question, but we're also going to look at the broader question, and that is, can these bones live? Now, that's a question that is asked of Ezekiel in chapter 37. I'm going to read this passage, Ezekiel chapter 37, and we'll read this together all the way down through uh, verse 14. Uh, and this is the, the case of the valley of the dry bones. And there is a lesson to be found here in the immediate context, what was this originally about, but they also the application of this to other parts of life. All right? Ezekiel 37. Now let me just set a little bit of background. What was happening here uh, is, is at this time uh, the nation of Israel had been judged by God because of their idolatry and their rebellion against God's laws. And so they had been captured by Babylon and taken over there and put in captivity. And this captivity lasted for 70 years. Well during that time Ezekiel was prophesying and part of it was Ezekiel was telling the nation of Israel over and over again, this is why this has happened to you. And then also giving them hope that there is a future past this present situation. So we come to chapter 37, verse 10. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. Now the description here is this valley is, is full of uh, dead people's bones, and they're completely bleached in the sun and dried out. There's no flesh on these bones, they're, they're just bones. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? Now Ezekiel is looking at this in the spirit, he's looking at this vision, and, and God asks him, can, can these bones live? And he gives the right answer. And I answered, and he, he said, O Lord, thou knowest. Now the idea is that there are some questions that can only be answered by God. There are some things that we won't know unless God tells us. So he said, O God, thou knowest. Again, he said unto me, prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up on their feet. An exceeding great army. 
Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves. And ye sh- and shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live. And I shall place you in your own land. And then shall ye know that I am the Lord, that I the Lord have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. Dear Father, I pray that you would help us to understand this passage of Scripture as it was given as a prophecy to Ezekiel, but Lord, also that we would understand the great question, can bones live? Can people live again after they have died? And what is the nature of the afterlife? Help us, Lord, to understand in our minds that we may apply it to our hearts and souls. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The intellectual question that we're looking at today is can dead, dry bones live again? And this question is similar to other questions, uh, such as, is there an afterlife? Uh, That's a question that people wrestle with, philosophers and thinkers. Uh, What's beyond this life? What's next? Uh, We see what we see. What about what we don't see? Uh, Can natural laws be broken? Uh, We know what we see, that people die, and then they decompose, and they're gone. Can this process be reversed? Can something happen where someone who is dead be alive again? Is there a spiritual dimension? And if so, how can we know about it? Is there a transcendent world? Is there an eternal soul? Are human beings more than just like the rest of the animals? Is there an existence for human beings beyond this life? And the scripture asks it this way, can these bones live? Can dead, dry bones live? Now, as is the case with most Old Testament prophecies, there is an immediate application and sometimes an immediate fulfillment. And then there is also an extended application and fulfillment. In other words, the prophecy is given that this is going to happen within a measurable amount of time, so it lends weight to the longer-term prophecy which is yet to come. Uh, And so it is, first of all, that this is about Israel. Now, the religious question that we would ask, the intellectual question is, can dead bones live again? But the religious question is, is is there a resurrection? And that's a very religious concept. And so I love the answer that Ezekiel uh, gave. He said, Lord, you know. He's not going to presume. He's not going to tell God anything that he doesn't know. He wants to listen. He wants to learn. Now, it comes down to this. If we're going to know something about something that we can't see, we have to have someone who sees it to tell us. If we're going to learn something about a place we've never been, we have to have someone who has been to that place to come tell us about that place. Now, the spiritual world, the other dimension that includes heaven and hell and the realm of God and the angels, that is something we cannot see with our eyes. We are material creatures, and we are limited to this material universe. And unless God works a, a work of grace and, and allows us to see these things, as he has sometimes done, uh, we are oblivious to them. Uh, there are several remarkable places in the Word of God where someone was able to have a vision and see heavenly things and even see angels and even see demons. And, and this is something that is rare, but it has happened. So only God can bring the dead back to life. We cannot do that. Uh, now, I, I, was on, uh, I worked at a hospital for years, and we would say sometimes that, well, somebody died, they passed, but we brought them back. Well, no, uh, I, I've done CPR hundreds of times. I've seen literally hundreds of people either respond to uh, resuscitation or not. Uh, sometimes there were people who had a flat line And that flat line continued, but we would continue to mash on their chest and pump in oxygen and do all kinds of things. And then we would see after several minutes go by a little blip and then another little blip and pretty soon a heartbeat would restore. And we say, well, we we brought them back. No, we didn't bring them back. They weren't quite dead yet. Uh, They were like, as some people say, they were just mostly dead. 
If someone is all the way dead, there's nothing I can do mashing on their chest that would bring them back. They have not yet gone. Uh, I, I do remember one instance where I was uh, doing CPR as, as I was on the crash team, as they call it, and I was uh, mashing on a fellow's chest, and, you know, and pretty soon he began to speak, and he said, quit it, it hurts. And so I stopped. I mean, that's, you don't want to hurt someone who's talking to you. Well, as soon as I stopped, his, his, he went, boo and flatlined again and his eyes closed and he was gone. So I started mashing his chest again and uh, he, he, he said, stop, it hurts. And so I stopped again and the doctor said, keep going. And so I kept on mashing on his chest while he kept complaining. And if I quit, he was flatlining. In other words, the only consciousness he had was the consciousness that I was artificially giving him with this. Now, they got his chemicals straight. They zapped him with the paddles a few times, and this drama went on, as I'd seen many, many times. And this fellow, in a few days, went home to be with his grandkids. Now, but he had not died. He was not dead yet. He just needed some help. He needed some help until his heart got, you see, his brain was still working. He was alive. But listen, if, if someone is dead, there's nothing you can do. You can jolt them with the paddles. You can inject anything you want. You can mash on their chest and do CPR. That's not going to bring them back. Only God can do that. That takes a miracle. And so I want to talk to you about this valley of dry bones. Now let's look at this. I saw a picture, and it showed the bones, but the bones were standing up as bones, like, you know, skeletons standing. But you know, when I read the scripture here, they didn't stand until the Lord brought them together and put flesh on them, and then the Spirit of God got into them, and then they stood up. So this is a more accurate picture. Now you can think about it. Ezekiel is preaching to bones. Now listen, when God tells you to preach to bones, you preach to bones. There's times in my ministry when I thought I was surely preaching to bones. There's times that when I was preaching when people looked at me and thought I was just bones preaching. But we don't want to have a dead sermon. We don't want to have a dead faith. But can you imagine what it took to stand up there and God's to preach to these bones? So he's preaching to the bones, and all of a sudden there's a shaking, there's a noise, and listen, bones begin to rattle. And they begin to find one another. And now they're scattered before. They're all here. You can't tell, you know, which bone goes where. They're all scattered about. But pretty soon uh, the toe bones started jumping onto the foot bones, and the foot bones started touching on the ankle bones. And like the tune of the old song, now hear the word of the Lord, they all were together. And so here we have all these bones coming together and this rattling going on and all these skeletons laying out in the valley of dry bones. Now this is a ghoulish thing. This is kind of freaky. They had this display they would carry around the country for a time and it was about the human body. And they had uh, bodies there that were just bones and they had some that had part of their muscle on them and some that had part of their skin, but not all. It was kind of ghoulish, but the idea was to learn about the fascinating parts of the body and how we're put together. And it is an amazing thing, but it's ghoulish, isn't it? Isn't it kind of upsetting? But he's watching this and the bones all find each other. And then the sinews, that is the ligaments, attach themselves. And then the muscles are all there. And then the skin has covered them up. Uh, but they're, they're just laying there dead. Well, see, listen, listen. Those bones didn't gather themselves together. Those bones didn't just spontaneously regenerate sinews and muscle. Those bones didn't decide, I think I'd like to have skin again. No, this was God doing what He does. God has to take that which is dead and reanimate it. This is a work of God. And so these uh, people that started out as bones and ended up having skin and everything, uh, they, they were still dead. They couldn't stand up. So I want to talk now about, first of all, the resurrection prophesied. The resurrection prophesied. Listen, we are told in the Word of God that there will be a general resurrection of the dead. Uh, those uh, that are the righteous and those that are unrighteous, those that are uh, saved and those that are lost, all people will one day be raised back up to stand before the judgment seat of God. Now, what the Bible says very clearly is you have an eternal soul, and in a matter of time, you will also have an eternal body and soul together to face eternity. That's what the Bible teaches. It prophesies this to us. 
Now in Job, Job chapter 19, verse 26, if you don't have time to look these up, just jot them down in a hurry and you can look at them later. But Job chapter 19, verse 26, this is what he said. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Now Job believed, as the people who were righteous did in the Old Testament, that even if your body dies, and even if you decompose, you will one day stand before God in a body. He believed this because God had revealed this to them. Now we also have in the psalm, Psalm 17 verse 15, uh, the psalmist says, As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. So he is talking about the time in which he goes to heaven and and he sees God. Daniel 12 verse 2 puts it very plainly. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So the Bible all the way in the Old Testament and in the New as well, as we'll see uh, as we go forward today, that the resurrection is foretold. It is prophesied. We are not just gone when we die. We're not just dead like an animal dies. We have something in us that's different. Now what is it that happened to Adam that was different than all of the other creatures God made? Well, Adam was formed from the dust of the ground, and then God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a what? A living soul. There's nothing else like that said about any other creature uh, in, in the Bible. Now, I know people are sentimental, and they like to think that their dog will be with them in heaven. I don't think that's the case. There's nothing in the Bible to give us that hope. Now, are there animals in heaven? Perhaps there may be. We don't know. I know there's uh, Jesus is coming from heaven on a white horse, and it's so very, they very well be uh, some type of creatures in, in heaven. But I, but I don't know that any other creatures here on the earth are going to die and then be found in heaven. I don't uh, have any scriptural evidence for that. But I do know from what the Bible says that we are different than the animals, and we have an eternal soul, and that our bodies will also be at a point resurrected. So the resurrection is prophesied. Now also we have the resurrection pictured. And we have that right here, don't we? Uh, Listen, uh, I, I think it's fascinating that God started with dead, dry bones. Now, what if God was starting with virtually nothing. What if some of these bones, now think with me, had been eaten by a creature and carried off? Does God say, well, boy, that bone's missing. I guess I'll work with what I have. And uh, God just has to put them together with some of their bones missing. Or perhaps someone was burned in a fire and their bones went up in smoke and there's just one little toe left. And God would say, well, this one, when they get to heaven, is just going to be a little toe. And he can hop his little toe around heaven. Oh, of course, that's ridiculous. Of, of course. Listen, but, but God used these bones as an illustration to picture it. All right? Now, here's the reality of it. God can take one little particle of whoever you were and remake you out of that, or he can make you all over from his DNA code that he has in heaven. God's not limited in any way. Do you realize that over time, there may be parts of people who lived long ago who are parts of you now? You don't like to think about it, but microscopic parts, molecules that might have been absorbed through a tree and into an apple, and then you eat the apple and you're eating the essence of that person who was in a coffin and the roots got the nutrition. I mean, I don't like to think about that, do you? But listen, when God decides to raise you up, he's not going to have to rob parts from me to make you. He's not going to have to rob parts from you to make me. God can have all of who you are without robbing parts from anybody else. If you were buried at sea and the fishes and the crabs ate you and carried you to the four corners of the world, God can remake you from wherever you were. God's able to do that. If you were incinerated or, uh, as people do today, uh, cremated, Uh, and went up into smoke and ash, God can haul you back uh, at at will. It's not hard. God can do it. 
But now here we have a picture of it that that which is uh, in the natural uh, scope of things, the skin goes first, and then the muscles go, and then the sinews go, and then the bones are left, and if it's left long enough, even the bones will go. That's what happens. The bones just go to powder in time. So God reverses this process, and this visually starting with bones, and reverses the process to bring it back, and He does it so it's, uh, it's visible. Now, what is the length of time the Bible says it will take when the Lord comes again for us to be changed? The twinkling of an eye. Now, as I understand the twinkling of an eye, some man gave it this uh, description. The, this, the, the amount of time that passes between the time the light turns green and the fellow behind you honks his horn. But no, it's actually very much faster than that. Uh, a twinkling of an eye is the speed of light. It is as fast as light goes. So God, when He decides to make you, poop, there you are. But here the process was observed. The bones came to the bones, the sinews and the muscles and the skin, and yet they're still dead. And they're not, they're, listen, they're not going to stand until the Lord gives them life. Uh, a dead man can't stand up. This whole idea of zombies is ridiculous. You ever notice how people are obsessed with zombies? I don't know how many zombie movies there are and zombie comic books and zombie this and zombie that. There's no such thing as zombies. If you're dead, you're dead. You're going to be dead until you're alive again, and then you're alive. Now, there's people who look like zombies and act like zombies, uh, but, but they're not real. Uh, the only thing that can uh, move and, and have life is something that's alive. And so there is the resurrection pictured. God can start with something or even from nothing to remake you. Listen, He knows how you're put together. He knows who you are. So there is the resurrection pictured. Now we also have the resurrection promised. The resurrection promised. Uh, it's something, listen, it, everything Jesus said was true. Everything Jesus said is going to happen is going to happen. His promises are true. We don't worship a Savior who guessed at things. We don't worship a Savior who just had speculations. We don't worship a Savior who had hopes and dreams. We worship a Savior who is the very God of the universe in human flesh, who cannot lie, who promised us certain things. And here is what we find in the Word of God. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you... He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken, that is to make alive, your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. What the Bible is saying here is just like Jesus was risen from the dead, you will be raised from the dead. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14 puts it this way, Knowing that He which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. The Bible promises us that we have a resurrection to look forward to. It is given to us by God, and God cannot lie. He has given us eternal life through Jesus Christ. Now, what this amounts to is here it is. In answer to the question, can these bones live? The answer is God knows. And what He has told us is the dead can come back, and they will come back. How many times have I stood at a grave? and seen a casket lowered into the ground. And we've prayed this prayer, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, and, and we give their body to the, to the ground, commit their soul to the earth to be, wait the resurrection. And we talk about those words, they mean something. I can remember one time I, I was called upon to do a funeral for someone who lost an infant, just a, a newborn. And uh, they, they, they had a little pink casket. It was a little girl that died right after childbirth, and it was the saddest thing you ever saw. And we were standing there uh, at a, uh, in a graveyard, and, and they had that little bitty casket, uh, pink in color, and flowers all over it, and people crying everywhere. And uh, that mom was there, still weak from childbirth, and had a, a, a tissue up to her eyes and was crying. The, the, the hopes and dreams that she had were lost, and, and she was about to commit to the ground that little one that she had given birth to. But I was able to comfort her and let her know that this isn't the end. This is, we're going to see that this person is going to be alive in heaven. You'll see her one day. 
Uh, and I believe that with all of my heart that the resurrection is promised. We will see those who have gone on before. And they say, well, will we recognize them? And I thought, well, I don't think I'll be dumber in heaven than I am now. Can you imagine going to heaven and, and not knowing stuff that, that you know here? I, I, I would know people I know. Uh, listen, when, when Moses and Elijah appeared with Jesus, the apostles, uh, Peter, James, and John, they saw Moses and Elijah meeting with Jesus. Now, how did they know it was Moses and how did they know it was Elijah? Were they wearing labels? Had on the back of his jersey, Moses? Elijah? No. They just knew. They just knew. Listen, there's something about you that makes you you. And it's not just your looks. Now, I can look at you and I can tell you from your looks, but in heaven we'll know each other by our essence. There'll be something about you. Uh, you won't recognize me in heaven if all you're looking at is my looks, because I'll be pretty in heaven. I'll look better. I won't be wearing glasses. I'll have a head full of hair like Samson did. I'll, I'll be strong and fit, and uh, I'll even be able to sing. And if you were just looking for somebody like Mark, don't, don't be looking. But listen, whoever Mark is inside in my soul will still be me. And you'll know me when you get to heaven. I'll know you when you get to heaven. You'll be different. You'll be better. But I'll still know you. When I see my grandma in heaven, she's not going to be an old lady. She's going to be in the prime of heavenly youth. And she's going to be beautiful. And she's going to be kind and gracious. And she's waiting for me to see her up there. And I'll know her when I see her. She won't look anything like I remember. But she'll look like my grandma. I believe that with all my heart. Listen, there were times, and this is interesting about Jesus, there were times when Jesus, after the resurrection, people who knew him didn't know him until he let them know him, and then they knew him. You remember the two that were walking with him on the road to Emmaus? They were talking with Jesus for a long time. He was just some person. They were talking, talking. Jesus was asking them questions and getting them to think, and so they went down, and, and Jesus was going to go further, and they said, well, come, come spend the night with us. Stay with us. It's too long. Stay with us. So he turns in and goes with them, and they're going to have a meal, right? So Jesus takes the bread, and he starts to bless it, and their eyes were opened. It's the Lord. And all of a sudden, poof, he was gone. Don't you just love stuff like that? And they looked at each other and they said, didn't our heart burn with us when we were with him? We didn't know why. We knew there was something special about him. But you see, we didn't have that full understanding. But whoever Jesus was inside, they, they were able to get that glimpse. I'm just telling you, what the Bible tells us here in, in, in the, the promise of it is that we have something that God has told us is going to happen. And we are now supposed to have the resurrection presented. We're supposed to preach it. We're supposed to present it. It is part of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the death, the burial, and resurrection. Listen, if, if you don't have the resurrection, the death and the burial doesn't mean anything. If you don't have a Jesus who came back out of the grave after three days and three nights, all you have is just another interesting religious leader who made speculative things and may have been right and may have been wrong, ho-hum. But what we have in Jesus Christ is one who predicted foretold, if they take this body in three days, I will raise it up again. And he did exactly that and appeared before witnesses and proved himself alive. So he is the resurrection presented. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Here it is. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. So here is the presentation of the gospel. Here it is. 1 Corinthians 15 Moreover, I de brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by the which ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. In other words, he says, I'm just telling you what I was told. I'm giving you what I was given. How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. This is the gospel. This is the presentation. In a nutshell, the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you will believe that and receive that, then you can be saved. When we baptize someone in the baptistry or wherever, it be a river or wherever we may baptize someone, we put them under the water and we bring them back up. 
And that's a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a, an image. It is a, a picture. Uh, and, and it speaks to the gospel. So the resurrection is presented. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body? Now I'm going to read that again because it needs to sink in. This is something that we don't want to just go over our heads or in one ear and out the other. We need this to go into our soul and take residence. Let me read that part again. Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Now what the Bible is saying here is that when you die as a believer in Christ, and when you are resurrected, your body will be like the body that Christ had when he resurrected. Now we've got to really think about that. We've got to let that settle in. The Bible says in Romans chapter 6 verse 5, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. So let's ask ourselves, let's take a little mental exercise. What kind of body did Jesus have when he arose from the dead? Well, first of all, the stone was rolled away. But do you realize that Jesus didn't need the stone to roll away to come out of that grave? He could appear from nothing. He could appear in a room behind closed doors. Jesus, if he had chosen to, could have just emptied himself from that grave miraculously and left the stone there. So what was the stone all about? Why to do that? Well, so the world could physically see he came out. It wasn't just something spiritual. It was something physical. So Jesus had a physical body. He wasn't just a spirit. He wasn't just ether. Uh, listen, he could be seen and he could be touched. He even said, touch me, handle me. A spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see me have. And they were able to handle him, the word of life. Uh, Jesus said, you got anything to eat? And they had some fish and a honeycomb. So Jesus starts eating. Now imagine this, if, if a ghost was eating. You'd see it go down and see it, res, res, you know, the, you could see through ghosts. Everybody knows that because we watch TV, right? And so if it's a ghost, you can see through them. Well, if they ate the food, the food would be watching them go down there and again, it'd be kind of weird. No, Jesus had a real body. You couldn't see through him. Uh, you could see him. You could touch him. He, he, he could eat. Uh, he was present. He, listen, he could walk on the ground. He wasn't floating around somewhere, you know. He, he was physical. He had a physical body. Let's don't miss that point. Jesus, when he said, I will rise again, he wasn't just talking about his spirit coming out. He was saying that his actual body, no matter what they did to it, that he was going to live again after three days. And he physically came out of that tomb and he physically appeared here and there. But he also had miraculous capabilities. He had a physical body that wasn't limited to the laws of physics as you and I are. He had a physical body that could transcend this reality to the next reality. How do I know this? Because he came here, he went there. Sometimes it appeared like he was even in two places at the same time. when He was just fast going from one place to another. Also, while he was teaching them on the Mount of Olives, he began to look like he was getting taller. And then it looked like, well, something's going on. And they look up and there was air under his feet. And he's rising. You talk about wonder. And then he began to be in the air. Nothing around him. No strings. This wasn't CG. This was real. And he's higher and higher. And listen, I'm going to just put you there a little bit. Is there a point during this when Jesus was ascending where you would get bored with it? 
And maybe you say, well, let's go play some cards. Or you say, well, maybe let's go eat lunch. No, I'm watching this all the way. <laughs> I'm watching this all the way. Jesus is rising. I'm watching how far is this going to go. And he's rising. He's rising. He's rising. And then he looks like he's just maybe as big as your thumb. And then maybe just as big as your little fingernail. And then he looks just like a speck. And the clouds recede him. And he's gone. And they're just hanging around looking. And then an angel appears. And I'm thinking, well, you're looking up. The angel might have put an elbow. Why stand you here gazing up? The same Jesus. The same Jesus. Now, now, now let's talk about the same Jesus. This Jesus who lived here with you. This Jesus who had a body that could be abused and could be beaten and, and could be bloodied and could be put to death. But this same Jesus who rose again the third day and came out of the tomb and appeared to you miraculously in a body that could appear uh, into this place or that place at will miraculously. This same Jesus who ye see now taken up away from you, this same Jesus shall come back to receive you so that you may be where he is. That's the promise of the resurrection. That is the presentation of the resurrection. This same Jesus is going to come again just like he left. Now, how did he leave? He left bodily. That's how he left. So how's he coming back? Bodily. He left into the clouds. How is he coming back? With the clouds. And I believe he's coming back to the same place he left, the Mount of Olives. The Bible says that his foot will touch the Mount of Olives and it's going to cleave asunder. It's going to separate. There's going to be all kind of geographical changes to the city of Jerusalem and to the land of Israel. So the nature of Jesus and his physical resurrection is he had miraculous capabilities. But I want to talk to you a little bit about something Jesus did on purpose that I don't think is going to be the case for you and me. Jesus decided to keep some scars. I don't think he needed to keep the scars. In fact, when you and I get to heaven, I don't believe we're going to have the scars. Listen, there's some people who've lost limbs. When you get to heaven, you're not going to have a missing arm or a missing leg. There's some people who've been burned in the fire and terribly disfigured. When you get to heaven, you're not going to look like that. There's, there, listen, there's scars we've had from uh, surgical wounds or, or, or any kind of accidents we may have had. I don't believe we're going to keep those scars when we get to heaven. Listen, when Jesus cleansed the lepers, the Bible says that they, their skin came like that of a child. So I don't believe that you and I are necessarily going to keep our scars. But Jesus kept his scars. He said, see the nail prints in my hand. See my side. Now, why did he do that? Listen, that has become part of his identity forever. And I think we need to con con contemplate this. Do you realize that the only thing that we made in heaven, the only thing that human beings made in heaven are the scars in the body of Jesus? We have made no other contribution. There's nothing in heaven that we have contributed and we have done other than the scars in his body. And I believe as we worship him and as we love him throughout eternity, we will forever be reminded of the price that he paid for our salvation. And we will be eternally grateful. Listen, Jesus won't even have a, a, a pile of materials so that when we get to heaven, we can finish our mansion. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if, if I know Jesus, the carpenter that he was, when we get there, it'll be trimmed out. It'll be right. It'll be ready for occupancy. It's not going to be some assembly required. It's going to be assembled, ready for us to take residence. Jesus rose from the dead, miraculous with a body that could be in heaven for eternity, and we will have the same wonderful resurrection. I'm thankful that we have the promise from God. But here's what we need to also be mindful of. There are people out there who need to hear this good news. They may have think they've heard it. They may have kind of heard it. They may have heard a rumor about it. But listen, they need a witness from somebody who believes it and has accepted it and has gotten eternal life because of it. They need a witness from you. They need a witness from me. Jesus 
rose from the dead, and he's going to raise us up too. Dear Father, we thank you for the great truth of Scripture, that there will be a resurrection, that this life isn't all there is. Lord, there's something more, something better, something eternal. And if we only understood it like we, like we should, we wouldn't worry so much. We wouldn't fret so much. We wouldn't have so much anxiety and so many fears. If we just knew, Lord, how temporary this life is and how eternal the next one is, Lord, we would have better perspective. We would be more grateful. Uh, Lord, we would be happier in the Lord and have more joy. Lord, help us to relish the wonderful thought that we have an eternity to look forward to. But Lord, we also pray for those who have not yet come to Christ in faith, knowing, Lord, that their eternity is fearful and bleak without salvation. And Lord, we owe it to them to give them a witness. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Let's